is done PhD research. And as I say, I'm going to try and come get under the ears of the in the 20 minutes here. So be patient. If I search without explaining, then he's going to ask me questions afterwards or, or, or whatever. So, so as it says, the background is, immediate background is, is that my own personal background, I'm, I'm a product of the Irish language revival. I went to an Irish Indian school. My father was incarcerated and turned up the trial. He learned Irish when he was incarcerated. He, he then sent me to the school. So I'm, I'm inextricably linked with the research itself. And again, as you may have I've heard on your tour last night, there's nothing exceptional about that. There, I come from West Belfast, where one in ten of the adult male population were incarcerated at one time. So it was something that's pretty common. Uh, in terms of the structure of the talk, I'm going to, I'm going to start off with a wee, bit, a wee bit about the aims of the, the research and, and, and the thinking behind it. I'm going to look at colonialism, I'm going to look at the context, the contextual setting of the work, and then I'm going to talk about imprisonment in Ireland and focus particularly on the long case and then the impact it had on the Irish language revival. So if you compare with me, as I say, well, the first facet is what we'll So in terms of the aim of the work itself, the aims, the framework and the and methods, it was two different pieces of, of research in effect. We're looking at the long cash prison struggle and the impact and the role played by the Irish language in the struggle against criminalisation and its impact on the community Irish language revival on the outside and how both elements of these research were intertwined and, and came together. So I was drawn together both of these elements of research and I was focusing on and, and, and drawing its inspiration from Fran Botman's contention that prison struggles can and do impact on struggles beyond the prison walls, or especially in, in the political realms. So I was looking at what motivated the prisoners to learn the Irish language, why they did it, what was the ideological compulsion behind it, and how this impacted the parents on the outside, and on the people on the outside. Why would parents in a poor working class area go through a struggle? commit themselves to be part of a struggle that gave them much more hassle than they would have if they were to send their kids to, to a, a normal English medium school. I contend it's because of ideology. And I'll be using George Rudy's contention about, about ideology, about the inherent and the derived. The inherent as in the mother's milk, our ideas about how the world works, what's right and what's wrong, and the idea behind the derived elements of ideology. These pieces of ideology that come from outside, that come from your school, your community, your, your aspiration and wherever you find you, 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 yourself in and how often these become absorbed and intertwined together. So I'll focus a bit on that. Just in terms of, of the actual aims, the, it's using, I used a critical research framework and it's breaking together the personal, social and the structural. So I'm saying that you cannot possibly look at the struggle that I'm talking about, the research that I'm talking about and divorce it from context and divorce it from structural context. So, so the, the actual method used was to privilege the view from below. It was to look at and to listen to those who were actually there and who actually saw and were actually part of their own history. So it, in a way, challenges the official histories and it gives voice to those elements history that was occluded intentionally or, or unintentionally in the past. So it, it, it's, it's using the Pilger notion of an insurrection of subjugated knowledge. And in the process, it challenges the, these views, these analyses, challenge the idea that there could, you have a value-free history. So I've already told you, I, I can't pretend to be, to be objective. I don't think anybody can be. And as Francis Fallon says, the native is, always, is, is often hit over the head with this notion of objectivity. I'm not objective and part of it. I'm not a propagandist. I adhere to Chomsky's contention of intellectual responsibility. But at the same time, I am part of this research. I position myself and defame what's important according to the people who are there. So that's the element, and colonialism, I have argued, is the context. So we can't divorce the reasoning behind identity and culture politics amongst Republican prisoners and amongst the wider Republican community without understanding colonialism. So we'll have to go in and talk a bit about that. And in my opinion, the decolonies and analytical model that I use can be recast itself as a form of resistance. So, so in terms of background, I'm going to just fly through this. The notions of imperialism, 
colonialism, the role of culture in colonialism, and neo-colonialism. We'll have Edward Tenney here who talks about colonialism, uh, about political collaboration, economic, social, and cultural dependence. We talk about empire, the First World War, the scrabble for territories. And then we have here colonialism as theorized by Jules Harmon, the, the moral civilizer. This is the motivation behind colonialism, the fact that that the colonies are the superior and this defines his right to direct the rest of humanity. But for our purposes, what's interesting in terms of the research that I carried out and in terms of the decolonizing resistance-based model that motivated the people who I interviewed was the role of culture in colonialism. We have here from Kenya, Nugi Watiango, who talks about economic and political control being impossible without mental control. And this element of mental control and what that means, and we'll place it a little bit as we carry on. Colonialism itself becomes neo-colonialism in the aftermath of the Second World War, the onset of globalization, of how the, the colonies could remove themselves from the cold face after a resistance struggle and rule from without the absentee landlord analysis where, whereby they could concentrate on the community capital, which is, is the main aim of colonialism. So we have here uh, Nukrami Kwame from Ghana who talks about the, this whole idea of exploitation with it redress power their responsibility and we'll see how the decolonization framework and people like Edward Said would talk about would continue long after so-called independence had been given over or as Francis Hanum would talk about it, the flag waving bourgeoisie would rule on behalf of, of the colonies or how the, the decolonization project would continue thereafter. So uh, that, that's just an element to say that we'll probably come back to. So what's interesting again for, for our purposes is decolonization. What, what is decolonization and, and, and what does it mean to me? So we'll have France Fanon here and Paulo Ferrer. And when I give this talk in, in communities, sometimes people will think of this. It's a Santa Claus and Mark Paulo Ferrer. It's Paulo Ferrer and So the idea behind it was the France Fanon analysis of the three stages of decolonization. First, the colonies were recognized that they're, as he would call it, the bottom of the barrel. They have lost. They are in absolute destitute. And from this point, the plot of a course of action. So retrieval, claiming back what's lost over history, and then at that point, trying to develop a something that is native, a native history, a literature, a sport, and from this here, a community revival could happen. As we'll call it, a genie coming out of the bottle that can't be put back in again. So he would argue the genie coming out of the bottle would lead to stage three, which is the campaign for national sovereignty. So he talks about it here. The faith for international culture means the first place the faith for the liberation of the nation. So we don't get involved in culturalism or Irish, Irish language or languages per se for the beauty that, that they may have on, on their own merit. We do it because it's tied to identity. It's tied to a struggle to claim back what was lost. So this is, it's very much how Fallon would see it. And as I was saying earlier on, Said would argue that, that this would continue, this project would continue long after the niceness bourgeoisie or the so-called independence had failed that, that idea or had failed that campaign per se. So Paul Ferrer, on the other hand, talks about the same thing when he talks about <coughs> conscientiation through education. And these two theorists, I would argue more than any other, compel and condition and explain this history that I've been talking about. He talks about, as we see here, the knowledge of the alienated culture leading to transforming action resulting in a culture being freed from alienation. So he talks about a knowledge recipient becoming a known subject, somebody moving from hopelessness and inferiority to becoming somebody who's developed the capacity to become an agent for change. So we'll see how that pans out in the Irish context here. So in terms of, this is as you asked, that we use here, the Gramscian idea of, of coercion and consent. We'll have here Evan Spencer, the emissary for Queen Elizabeth talking about displacing the language of the conduct and using all means to force him or her to learn his. So all means were used in Ireland. But in terms of the consensual element, which is key to this here, the point that Tugi Watiango was talking about earlier on, talking about inferiority, talking, talking about the more the invasion is accentuated, those invaded must, come, must become convinced of their own intrinsic inferiority. They must buy into it. As, as Mame says, in order to free himself, he must agree to destroy himself. So this is the whole idea behind, behind colonization and its impact. So the more the latter want to be like the invaders, to walk like them, to dress like them, to talk like them. Uh, we're going to fly the Irish history here as fast as we can. This is, again, the idea of conquest, dispossession, assimilation. The, 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 the conquest, again, is based on power and 
and, and profit. The same thing, the civilizing the natives from barbarity, in this case the Irish. And again, this development having, having the defeat of the Irish in 1601, which is followed by the penal laws and hundreds and hundreds of years of, of oppression and conflict and resistance, which, is, which ends up in the assimilation of, a, of a, a cadre or an element or a section of this population. In this case, the political leadership under Daniel O'Connell, who was purporting to be an emancipator, when really he was only interested in emancipating his own class, he was going about speaking at monster rallies, telling people in Irish they should talk in English. So this was the whole idea of becoming assimilated. The Catholic Church in 1785 uses the English language with its prisoners. It makes it a huge change, but 85% of its, of its its actual prisoners are mono Irish speakers who don't understand English. So this is the whole process of assimilation. As we talk about here, the national schools, which would cement that, the same thing that was seen 100 years later, we would see in Kenya. And, and so one this whole element of, of cementing the idea of inferiority, of inculcating the seeds of inferiority in those who are the victims of, of, of colonialism. In the Irish context, it would culminate in Druck Hill, as it was known, with the Great Hunger. So we would have three million Irish people either dead or fled in emigration and death. All of them to the man, monoglot Irish speakers. So the poor, the language of the poor is a language of this. So this brings us to de de decolonization and reconquest. As Fanon says, the bottom of the, of the barrel. In 1891, the census showed that nobody wanted to admit they could speak Irish. The Irish, man, the Irish speaker was like the abominable snowman. Such, such was the disregard that was attached to barbarism that was attached with the Irish language. So again, the process of decolonization through sports, the Gaelic through sports coming to the Gael, GAA, the fastest growing sporting organization in the world. You have Conrad the Gaelic, the Gaelic League, the fastest growing social movement in Western Europe, which by the time of 1900 had 800,000 members. Why were they doing it? Why were they becoming members of it? Again, back to this whole idea of ideology, because they believed it was part of something greater. They believed it would lead them to something greater. In this case, that was culminated in the Easter Rising of 1916. And the Piercian idea of you can't be free unless you're Gaelic speaking, you can't be Gaelic speaking unless you're free. And this, I would argue, this idea would become part of that ideology, would become part of that mother's milk for a certain amount of, of the of, of population, and it could be used again thereafter. So in terms of prisons themselves, <coughs> political imprisonment in Ireland, we'll have a quote here from Mandela, who talks about prison being the aim of prison to take away identity. And, and so on, and the quote from Fran Putman talking about the shape, how this can shape the political dynamics beyond the prison wall itself. But in this context, in the Irish context, imprisonment was often used and conditioned to deal with the campaigns of nationalism and republicanism for a form of, of, of national sovereignty. So the case here that we use. From Thomas Clark, who was shot and killed in the Easter Raisin in 1916. He was a Fenian who was chained, he was chained to a wall for 15 years because of his, his role in, in the, the dynamite campaign in the 1880s. He was chained to a wall and he talked about how himself and his comrades, most of them went insane, lost their minds, and so on. But he talked about his ideology of self sacrifice would condition the view that Republicans would hold thereafter and still hold, people who are still in to this day still hold. And this whole idea of standing, of fighting relentless odds, but at the same time resolved never to give in, with nothing to, to sustain him but his own courage and the pride he had in being an Irish Indian. This is very, very important because this would condition people's take, people's ability, people's ability to resist thereafter. And this is the difference between the political conscious prisoner and the, the, the prisoner who finds it in, in, in himself incarcerated as a so-called ordinary prisoner. The, this whole idea that they're part of something greater, they may be part of a community who they say that it's, it's supportive, and this has a revive impact on their um, prison.